Hiya folks, Carl James here from Electric Media Madness. In this video I'm going to be giving you a quick review and analysis of Doctor Who's two-part Spyfall story. Part 1 kicked off season 12 on New Year's Day, uh, with part 2 following a few days later. I had hoped to get this channel moving with the first episode of Doctor Who season 12. Uh, unfortunately I've been very poorly over the past few weeks um, that's delayed my channel debut uh, but nevertheless uh, better late than never so let's kick things off with a brief recap of the story the basic plot of this two-parter revolves around the strange deaths of some uh, MI6 agents at the hands of a mysterious alien race who are later revealed in the story as being the the Kasavan is it the Kasavan uh, head of MI6C, played by Stephen Fry, recruits the Doctor and her fam to investigate, and this leads them to onto the trail of the CEO of VOR, which is a search engine media company. And the CEO is called Daniel Barton, who's played by Lenny Henry. The Doctor also connects with MI6 agent O, played by Sasha Duan who's revealed later in the climax of two, uh, part one to be an incarnation of the Doctor's long-time Time Lord adversary, the Master. It's also revealed that the Master's in league with both uh, Daniel Barton and the Kasavin. And in part two of the story, uh, the Doctor's propelled by the Kasavin into the Upside Down from Stranger Things of all places. From there, she goes to 1834, where she meets uh, Ada Lovelace. Then it's on to Paris during World War II where she meets uh, British spy Nora Anyat Khan. And the whole time she's being pursued by the Master. The Doctor eventually retreats to the present day where she follows a plot involving the Master, the Kasavan and Daniel Barton to rewrite the DNA of every human being basically on the Earth in order to turn them into walking hard drives, data hard drives. And that's basically about it in a nutshell for the story. Uh, there's a few other bits and bobs going on, largely in part one, um, involving car, two car chases, a basketball game, some corporate snooping, a party at a vineyard, a near miss plane crash. But it's all pretty much fluffy stuff designed as eye candy to fill out a largely pedestrian and mundane plot, really. Uh, significantly, both parts are written by Chris Chibnall. Uh, there's a few, albeit they're very brief, good moments here and there. Uh, I will admit to being very genuinely surprised by the reveal of the Master in Part 1, probably because the Doctor Who fan part of me has faded away after sort of Season 11. I haven't really been following any of the rumours and spoilers about Season 12, so it's, it's pretty new to me. I wasn't aware of it. The Return of the Master does present some issues for me, though, even though I did actually enjoy that reveal. And that's largely because, like Jodie Whittaker's portrayal of the Doctor, which I'll come back to that shortly, I'm just not really that convinced by uh, Sasha Duan's portrayal of the Master. Uh, there seems to be something that's missing out it's out of step with other versions of the character in the whole 50 years of the show and unlike Jodie Whittaker's portrayal of the Doctor I, I can't really put my finger on what it is um, perhaps it's just too different for me it's just that it's a new direction for how the character is going to be portrayed from now on um, Sasha Duan is a very good actor and I really do hope that his employment in the show was because of his sterling acting chops rather than a result of the BBC's evidentially documented diversity hiring strategy. I would think it is because of his acting. Um, speaking of that, actually, there does seem to be some evidence of that sort of thing going on in other parts of the story, but specifically two part, part two of the story, actually. There's a really jarring insertion of Ada Lovelace and Nora Inya Khan alongside the Doctor to create this perception of three strong female role models working together to foil the alien agenda in the story. And quite frankly, the story could have been told without the involvement of these two characters. And they seem to have been included for a bit of, sort of tokenistic signalling towards identity politics, basically. And make of that what you will, but that's, that's my take on that. Um, I do feel that he's done a very ham-fisted and deceptive way, particularly because Ada Lovelace, well, if you're naive enough to believe the narratives that the BBC insert into any and all of their historical programme that they broadcast, whether that be fictional or otherwise, then you would go away from this story convinced that Ada Lovelace was one of the very first computer programmers cr or creators in history. And if you did think that, then you would be wrong, really, because whilst being whilst you know she was one of the first women in that role, a point which the BBC actually fails to readily emphasise that you know the fact that she's one of the first females in that role, 
Um, there were many male programmers that predated her by many, many years, such as uh, Johann Kepler during the 1600s, Joseph Lalande, William Wales, Israel Leons the Younger, uh, Richard Dunthorpe during the 1700s. And if you really want to get back in time, you know, and get really precise, you can go back and look at the Antikythera mechanism, which was an analog computer device built and programmed by the ancient Greeks sometime between 60 and 205 BC. And why I mention this is because it demonstrates how the BBC, yet again, cherry picking their way through history in order to support a manufactured contemporary social political narrative. So history be damned as far as the BBC is concerned. I'm sure the naysayers will say that Doctor Who isn't about historical accuracy if they want to rebut what I've just said. But it's interesting that those naysayers were singing a very different tune during seasons 11 when episodes like Rosa and Demons of the Punjab were being aired. But that's um, something for another time. On that subject, I initially felt that season 12 was dialing back some of the identity politics in uh, part one of Spyfall. Um, despite the lying from the Doctor about not uh, not being a man because she's had an upgrade. Daniel Barton's remark about Whip being one of the few non-white faces at my school. Yaz's dig at Barton because his company seemingly ignores online abuse and cyberbullying. Um, but part one felt like a little step out of the dogmatic darkness of season 11. But it, it also felt like the producers had finally realised what they'd taken away from the real fans of Doctor Who and were trying, at least in this episode, to address the balance. Um, the episode seems to be a bit more brightly lit than anything so far in the Chibnall era. Um, for the first time, the music of the show seemed to be a little more pronounced and memorable, at least in my eyes as well. But that quickly disappeared in part two of this two-parter. The episode, once again, it embraced the dark and dingy cinematography of season 11. I couldn't help but wonder if the revelations about the Master and Gallifrey were actually member berries for the long-time viewers. Um, but rather than... Well, they actually weren't long member berries for the long-time viewers, actually. But more, more likely, a, a foreshadowing of the kind of things that Ryan Johnson did with Star Wars The Last Jedi. With the line, let the past die, kill it if you have to. It's the only way to become who you were meant to be. But in this case, we've got the Master telling the Doctor, everything you think you know is a lie we're not who we think so is it foreshadowing does the bbc have any intention of letting those fans who weren't indoctrinated by the identity politics of season 11 back through the tardis door we'll have to wait and see but i do believe we do have some cause for concern it's generally known that the new producers like to put their own mark on existing IPs. There are those who do tend to care and have consideration for established mythology and canon, um, but others simply just piss all over it whenever they get the opportunity to. And we've seen that a lot in genre recently in the last few years. Disney Star Wars basically nullified the journey, deeds and sacrifices of characters like Anakin and Luke Skywalker. Star Trek Discovery did the same with Spock and Captain Pike. So will Chris Chibnall's new direction for Gallifrey completely pull the rug out from underneath what Russell T. Davis and Stephen Moffat did with the Time Lords? Time will tell, I suppose. My big standout issue with this two-part story, as it was with season 11 really, is the character of the Doctor during the post-Stephen Moffat era. Every portrayal of the characters eventually delivered a line or a scene or a wealth of scenes for that matter that gave the viewer a great big reminder of what the Doctor was, what his character stands for. In the modern Who area, Christopher Eccleston delivered it in his very first episode basically when he held Billy Piper's hand and talked about the earth turning. David Tennant did it atop the Sycorax ship in the first uh, his first story, The Christmas Invasion. Matt Smith did it, staring into the eye of the Atraxi on the roof of Ledwood Hospital. Peter Capaldi, for me, took a wee bit longer to get there, but he still got there before the end of the first episode, Deep Breath, when he reminded Clara Oswald that he was still the Doctor, basically. But with the 13th Doctor, I very much feel like I'm still waiting. A season and a bit in, and I've yet to see that line or that moment when I can say, yes, she's finally got it, that's the Doctor. Maybe from here on out, the character's been changed in such a way that the writers feel it's no longer necessary to include those sorts of traits in the character is it the writing is a distinct possibility given that everything in the chibnall area with the exception of maybe kablam has felt flat and boring for want of a better way of putting it or is it jodie whittaker's acting a dramatic portrayal of the role maybe it's all of those things i don't know but i find it incredibly disappointing in a show that until recently i've had a very special place in my heart for really you know and it's very disappointed 
one final area that I want to touch on, a bit more, a little bit uh, strange one, this one, but you'll see where I'm going with it in the future. It's something that I'm going to touch on. It's, it's sort of a teaser, really, for a future video that I'm going to be doing um, in my In the Weeds series on this channel. Basically, I found the whole concept of MI6 narrative in this two-part of very telling. We've got the Kasavan compared to Russian infiltration. I think there's a very brief mention of Russian bots actually in the story. And let's not forget the MI6 agent killed in Moscow at the very start of the two-parter. We also have a blatant nod via the cyberbullying dialogue to the real-world British intelligence-led online harms white paper in the use. Some people in the UK might know of that. Something which it really is steering and dictating BBC policy more and more by the day. And in this Doctor Who story, it's blatantly implied that MI6 were responsible for shutting down Unit and Torchwood. Unit and Torchwood, past allies and key players in the series earlier mythology. So let's extend that analogy out into the real world for a moment. Could we argue that there are external agencies reshaping the BBC away from its past, even destroying it? And hopefully I will be bringing a very detailed answer to that question in the near future. But to sum up this two-parter, I was initially intrigued by part one. It felt a little bit of a step back in, in a direction that I was happier with with Doctor Who, more towards the tone of Doctor Who that I'd missed, but it still felt significantly short really of what it should have been um a four out of ten for part one part two on the other hand was total reverse again back to season 11 it's the story seemed to go nowhere the ada lovelace sort of aspects of the story seemed to be completely redundant the gallifrey reveal was very lackluster compared to the historical past series revelations I found it incredibly annoying that Jodie Whittaker had at least three opportunities in that episode to finally deliver her I am the Doctor and don't you forget it moment. But it never happened. And yeah, the question you have to ask is why? For me, it's a paltry two out of ten for episode two. Uh, so that's all for now. You can catch me again for my next review of Doctor Who season 12, which will be episode three. I believe it's entitled Orphan 55. In the meantime, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to like and share. Uh, if you like my content, subscribe to the channel as well. Also, don't forget to click the bell icon for notification of new content. And I'll catch you again real soon.